but we don't commit in our heart to do what God desires or to make something right in our lives. So we want to serve God with pure hearts and wholeheartedly. Uh, and uh, we're going to, uh, as we uh, as we go through the lesson today, we're going to try to hopefully make personal application. spoke uh, thousands of years ago. So with that being said, I would like to simply read our printed passage and then we will go verse by verse uh, as I like to do uh, and see uh, what we can learn. So beginning at verse 27, again, Jeremiah 31, verse 27 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. Verse 28, And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down, to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Verse 29. In those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the day comes, the days come, saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their it in their hearts and it and will be to will be their God rather and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And our key verse is verse 33, which is, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Okay, I, I wanted to mention also that the the standard uh, lesson has two major divisions. Uh, the first is reversal of judgment, reversal of judgment, and that's covered between verses 27 and 30 of chapter 31 of Jeremiah. And the second is restoration of relationship, restoration of relationship, and that's covered between verses 31 and 34. In the way of background, um, Jeremiah uh, began his uh, prophetic ministry in the 13th year of Josiah. Many of you will remember Josiah was one of the, the good kings of, uh, of Judah who did that. That was right in the sight of the Lord. Um, his contemporaries um, during his ministry, which lasted some 40 years, were Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Daniel, uh, and uh, he uh, also ministered or prophesied during the, the reigns of the last five kings of Judah, including Josiah, Jeconiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, and uh, we know that he prophesied uh, to those who went into exile into Babylon. We know that was uh, that was done in three phases. The last being uh, in 586 BC. Uh, he basically told them to uh, get comfortable. You're going to be there for a 
while. In fact, he prophesied they would be there for some 70 years. Um, and we know that, and he was left, of course, with um, those left in Judah. And ultimately, because of uh, some treasonous activity on the part of Zedekiah, ended up going to Egypt where tradition has it that he died. Uh, but throughout his uh, prophetic ministry, uh, most of uh, the prophecies God uh, uh, had him prophesy were concerning judgments. He prophesied about uh, Babylon and how uh, they were that seething pot that was about to spill over. He prophesied about how, uh, anyway, he, pro he prophesied primarily about judgments. However, uh, in this section of uh, the book of Jeremiah, uh, between chapter 30, verses 1, verse 1 rather, and 33, verse 26, uh, he basically provides consolation for the children of Israel. In fact, that section of Jeremiah is called the book of consolation. Uh, and that is where our lesson uh, is drawn from today. And we know that God, through uh, many of his prophets, uh, spoke judgments, but usually included with the judgment was some promise of restoration or some promise of deliverance after the judgment. Uh, we're going to see in our lesson today uh, Jeremiah talking about uh, the last days. Uh, when uh, the Lord Jesus will return uh, and set all things right. So we're going to get into our lesson. We're going to go verse by verse. So the first division in the uh, adult quarterly, again, is a promise restoration, verse 27 and 28. First division from the adult quarterly is reversal of judgment. Verse 27, behold, the days come, saith the Lord that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. But what does that mean? I mean first of all, behold, that's the term that's uh, left off in many of the more modern uh, translations, the NIV, for example. But behold is an expression, a Hebrew expression, that's meant to, to, to get someone's attention. You know, this is important, you know, pay attention. Uh, and the King James uh, captured that, that sense. Uh, he says he will sow the Lord, um, capital L, Lord, uh, caps, uh, means Jehovah. That's his personal name, Yahweh, the self-existent one. He says he will sow the house, meaning the, uh, the nation in this case, or the lineage of Israel, descendants of Israel, and the house of Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom he's referring to and the southern kingdom are with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. What he's talking about is replenishing uh, the nation with the people and the beast. And he's going to do that in such a, a rapid fashion that it will appear as if seeds uh, or plants are springing up from seeds when he says he's going to do this. So he starts out talking about how he is going to replenish the land with both people and beasts. And now he says the days come, the days come. Uh, we know that uh, uh, a remnant of the Israelites returned to Judah uh, after the Babylonian captivity. And that was partial fulfillment of this prophecy, partial fulfillment, but the ultimate fulfillment is yet to come. Ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy is yet to come. God often uh, fulfills uh, his promises in stages. He gives a short-term partial fulfillment and, and the ultimate fulfillment uh, in a time future. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Now, we... Uh, we know, uh, well, those who are familiar with uh, the book of Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah, know that when uh, God called Jeremiah in the first...
first chapter, chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, he mentions that he is going to um, send him with a message. He was going to send him with a message of both judgment and of restoration or promise. In fact, uh, those verses read verse 10. See, this is from Jeremiah chapter 1. I have this day set thee over the nation and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down. Jeremiah, what seest thou? And he said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen. God has uh, sent uh, this word almond uh, is the same has the same meaning of hasten, uh, translated from the Hebrew. Uh, but God has um, called Jeremiah to be his instrument to pronounce both judgments, how he is going to tear down and to destroy for sin, uh, for the sin of his people, but also how he's going to plant and to rebuild. Now let me just uh, very quickly read a, a section from the standard commentary regarding this. I mean, obviously we know what it means to, to tear down and to destroy God uses other nations as his instruments of judgment uh, and uh, to, to watch and to, uh, to build. Uh, we know what that means as well. But uh, the commentator says uh, these two segments reflect the twofold purpose of Jeremiah's prophetic men ministry to Judah. One, pronounce uh, pronouncement of judgment upon the nation because of their sins. And two, the subsequent restoration after the people have gotten the message regarding who's behind both. But also behind the restoration, blessing them with restoration. And we see these, uh, these themes, blessing and our judgments throughout the book of Jeremiah. Verse 29, and this is an old proverb, in those days they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. Well, you can see that also in um, Ezekiel 18.2. What's it mean? Uh, basically, it was something that the children of Israel were uh, using uh, to basically shift blame. Uh, they found themselves in uh, being exiled to Babylon. The, na the northern kingdom had been exiled uh, in 722, more than 120, 30 years earlier. Uh, and they find themselves... Uh, needing a scapegoat, needing somebody to blame for the fact that uh, they're being judged, they're being exiled. So they're blaming their their ancestors, their fathers. They're saying their fathers sinned, and now they're having to pay uh, the penalty for their father's sin. And that's a pretty common thing for us to do today. We, we know it way back in the Garden of Eden, uh, there was blame going on when God uh, confronted Adam and Eve. Of course, Adam blamed the woman who God gave him, in fact, blamed, blaming God, and Eve blamed the serpent, and so forth. And we still do that today. We blame others for uh, our failure to, to live the kind of lives that God would have us to live. Now, we should also notice that in, in the children of Israel trying to blame their the sins, God, for judging them for the sins of their father, they're also saying that God is unjust if God is blaming or judging them for something that their fathers did. And, you know, we don't want to be uh, too quick, the commentator says, to dismiss this blame shifting because, uh, you know, God did say that he would judge the generations of children for the sins of their parent. And there is some consequential uh, judgment, if you will, on generations that of those who neglect or to those who forsake God. We go back to Exodus uh, chapter 34, verse 7, and God says, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sin, and that will be by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers 
upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Now, there are instances in the Bible where God actually uh, did judge uh, descendants of uh, people that sinned greatly for as a consequence of the sin of their parents. We even look at the uh, uh, AI, uh, the Battle of AI. Uh, we know that some uh, that some uh, uh, booty, if you will, was stolen. That God did forbid, forbidden. He said that everything was to be uh, turned over to Joshua, uh, hidden in the uh, the the floor of the tent. Uh, actually, it was uh, Achan who uh, stole uh, from uh, the. the was uh, uh, that was taken when uh, when uh, Jericho was uh, was captured, uh, and Achan buried this these goods uh, in the floor of his tent. And of course, when that was discovered, uh, he was killed and his wife and children for his sin. So there is precedent for this. However, God is saying that in this day, this day to come, there would be no judgment of anyone for any sin other than their own. We see also in, in our world today, and this has always been the case, the natural consequences of sin. If, uh, if a person, a uh, person's father uh, was a criminal and in prison for most or all of his life, obviously he suffered uh, not having a father in the household to help raise him, or if he, uh, his father or mother were a drunk or a drug addict, uh, they suffered as a result of that. So uh, people have suffered for the sins of their parents, uh, for parents for many years. And we could go on with that. Uh, we, we see in the Old Testament how God commanded the Israelites uh, to, to go out and to conquer people and to kill uh, all women, uh, children, and so forth. And, 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 and that is very difficult for us to understand somehow until we, we, we really try to see uh, what's being done from God's perspective. God holds every soul accountable for their own sin, and certainly the children uh, that uh, were destroyed in that process uh, had no sin, the sins of their parents, and God certainly, uh, I'm sure, uh, figures has understands every converging factor and actually brings those children into uh, his presence uh, and saves them from a life that would corrupt them and, and doom them to hell. So and so much for that. I'm, I, I could get sidetracked, and I can get sidetracked pretty easily. I'm going to try to stay focused and, and get through the lesson in a timely way. So we're going to move on. Verse 30. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Again, everyone will be accountable for their own sin. Everyone will pay for their own sin. There will be no consequences of the sins of your father that will affect your uh, your judgment. In fact, that is the case now. I mean, you may suffer temporally in this life, but as far as your relationship with God and where you will spend eternity, whatever your foreparents did had no bearing on that and has no bearing and will have no bearing on that. It's about your relationship with Christ. That matters. Now we're going to move into the second division of the standard which is restoration of relationship restoration of relationship verse 31 behold the days come saith the lord that i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah now we said uh, uh, in our introductory remarks that uh, this word covenant in this context means promise he is going to make a new promise and that's 
presupposes that there is an old covenant if God is going to make a new one. And if there is a new one, uh, there is a reason for the new one. Something happened with the old one that uh, uh, meant that God needed to replace it with a new one. Now he says, with the house of Israel, in this case, uh, we believe we're speaking of the northern ten tribes and with the house of Jacob. Now, the northern ten tribes have been dispersed. Again, they were uh, taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. But God is intending to, uh, for this promise to be to all Israel, uh, all twelve tribes or those descendants of the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, we might add that uh, this is the only place in the Old Testament that the term New Covenant is used. Uh, in fact, um, the Greek word translated from New Covenant in Hebrews 8.8 uh, 8, uh, and uh, chapter 12.24 uh, is New Testament uh, it's also translated New Testament by the Lord Jesus himself in Luke 22:20 20 and 1 Corinthians 11:25 25 uh, at the Lord's Supper. He talks about the New Testament in his blood, the New Testament. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a minute, but the New Promise or New Testament in his blood is what we are currently under today, not the Old Covenant, which we're going to talk about here, uh, beginning at verse 32. And verse 32 says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. What covenant was that? The covenant that God made with their fathers, the ancestors of the, the, the people that Jeremiah is speaking to today and those future uh, Israelites. That covenant was the covenant that God gave through Moses at Mount Sinai. It was a covenant of the law. Okay, we can read about that in Exodus chapter 19 from chapter 19 to 24. But the Israelites, uh, they broke that covenant. They repeatedly uh, broke that covenant by sinning and the national sin. Uh, certainly there were individual sins of the individual laws, but the greatest national sin was one of idolatry. Uh, the children of Israel were said, uh, spoken of as having going whoring after other gods, the gods of the heathen around them which uh, involved uh, all kinds of, of sexual acts in many cases that enticed them, but they were, uh, that was a national great sin. So they broke God's covenant in every respect, not only uh, in, uh, in terms of idolatry. Uh, now, because they were not able to keep that covenant, God saw a need for a new covenant. Now, obviously, God his foreknowledge knew that they were not going to keep that that covenant and that a new covenant was his plan from the beginning. He had in, in his plan from the beginning a new covenant that would be in the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, this being the new covenant. After those days, said the Lord, those days, we don't know how many, but this is yet. This was yet to come from Jeremiah's time. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, you know, God, we know that the original covenant, the law, the summary of the law, the Ten Commandments, there were more than 600 specific laws that were summarized, that were given to Moses, that were summarized in the Ten Commandments. The Lord Jesus summarized them to two. Love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But God 
I wrote those laws on tablets of stone originally. Uh, now he is saying he's going to put the law in the inward parts and write them on the heart. Now what do we mean by, by, by heart here? We're not talking about the physical heart. We're talking about, in this case, the seat of the intellect, the seat of the emotion, the seat of the will of man. Uh, we're talking about putting uh, this as deeply in within the person's being as you can put something. That is what God wants to do. He wants to implant his law uh, in them. Uh, we know that uh, the Old Testament law forbade certain actions, uh, but God also intended for this law to be in their hearts and in their minds. Uh, if we go back to uh, Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, we read uh, not only God's intent that the law be in their hearts, but the summary of the law that the Lord Jesus gave. It reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And he goes on in verse 7, he said, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God intended for his law to penetrate the very being of, of the children of Israelites. Now, um, so he is saying, also he's saying, after those days, he says he's going to do this, but he's saying, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Well, that's always been God's uh, desire, to be the God of his people. First, his people Israel, and it's promised to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through his seed or his descendants. Uh, God intends for all to be his people. But in order to be his people, we have to be in a faith relationship with him. We're not his people because we, are, we were created by him. Uh, to be a cre creation of God or a creature is one thing, but to, to call, be able to call him our father means that we have a faith relationship with him. Uh, and we, uh, as believers in Jesus Christ, know that that is through none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because of our faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness that has been imputed to us or transferred to us or credited to our account. I like to use a word picture. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And that gives us a standing before an, uh, an all holy God. A completely holy God. Otherwise we have no standing. We have no relationship with God our Father. Now. Who enables us to be his people, or how are we enabled to be his people? His people means we are, uh, again, we have a faith relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're also walking in obedience to his will. Uh, we are enabled to be his people through the Holy Spirit, who indwells every believer, every Christian, uh, and uh, I don't know that we have time now, but take a look at Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 5 to 11, and you see how the Holy Spirit enables us to, to be his people, to walk uprightly as he would have us to walk. So finally, we're going to look at verse 34, which reads, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more.
Now we need to uh, remember who Jeremiah's audience is or who the Lord's audience is through uh, his prophecies through Jeremiah. Uh, he is uh, speaking to the nation Israel. He's speaking to Israelites. Uh, and he's saying uh, that they won't teach uh, anymore every man his neighbor, every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. We will not have to evangelize uh, the Jewish people anymore as uh, we are doing today. Um, and they are some of the more dif difficult converts uh, to Christianity, even though they have this, this beautiful heritage of faith in the oracles of God uh, that he gave uh, those, that, that, uh, those people. Uh, but uh, everyone, he's saying, will know the Lord. I mean, the, the Spirit of God will implant God's, the knowledge of God and his law in uh, everyone in those days. We're talking about a time after Christ's return. Uh, and again, go back to Romans 8, 5 to 11 and read that and you'll talk up, you'll see how uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse, uh, the wrong passage, I should say. But uh, they will know the Lord uh, and from the least it said of them to the greatest of them, from the beggar in the street to the, uh, the, the most highest uh, uh, office holder in the land. Uh, and he says, for because I will forgive their iniquity, their sin, and will remember their sin no more. He is going to forgive them. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that it's carte blanche. He's going to forgive them as a nation, but he's going to forgive each and every individual one that confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior just as he has forgiven each of us who've done that. We all come to uh, uh, a personal relationship with God and salvation uh, through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. You know, if I could just back up for uh, a second and say uh, just another word on uh, the, the reason we won't uh, need to be taught or those uh, Israelites, future Israelites will not need to be taught to know God. They will have direct access to God uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Hebrews uh, uh, 4.16 uh, tells us that we can come boldly before the throne of God. And if we go over to uh, Hebrews uh, 10 uh, 19 to 22, it talks about us be having direct access to the throne through the veil, that is, the flesh of Jesus Christ. And then 1 John 2 uh, and 27 uh, tells us, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie and even as it hath taught you ye shall abide in him okay that anointing is a him that anointing is the holy spirit the holy spirit is our comforter that uh, the lord promised to send but also our guide in truth he will teach us he will show us the take the things of christ and show them unto us and make us, give us that personal relationship that we need to God our Father through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, while I said uh, earlier the, uh, that Jeremiah is, is prophesying to the Israelites, this promise does not only apply to the Israelites. We know it applies to all those who come to faith in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, read Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, of all those uh, from all nations who appear before the throne uh, of God uh, in heaven. Uh, God is obviously is going to be calling uh, people to himself 
from all nations and, and it talks about a number that cannot be counted of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palms with palms and hands and i i'd like to point that out to the jehovah's witnesses when they come over to uh, uh to try to talk to me uh and won't listen to me uh because they maintain that only 144 thousand the hundred and forty four thousand which they uh, erroneously uh, don't well they don't understand uh, who they are uh, actually appear in heaven uh, in the presence of God before the presence of God but there's an innumerable number that do but in conclusion um, you know we we, we, we see that uh, God is promising restoration of Israel uh, he, of course, judged them with the exiles uh, of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., the exile of Judah, ultimately the final exile in 586 B.C., and actually the, uh, the return uh, of the remnant was uh, just a partial restoration, uh, but the real inauguration of uh, this restoration uh, came when Jesus at his first advent and we see in Hebrews chapter 8 how Jesus fulfills uh, this uh, the prophecies in between uh, verses 31 and 34 Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 concerning uh, the new covenant uh, just very quickly, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7, uh, the writer states, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their father. Now he repeats verbatim uh, a a quote from Jeremiah chapter thirty one uh, to thirty one to thirty four, and he he ultimately says that this is the fulfillment, uh, or that Jesus actually fulfills this covenant as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. John three sixteen says. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, the one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus paid the penalty for all of our sins. And because of that shed blood, the blood of the New Testament, uh, the blood that, that, that actually is the foundation of the New Testament, we can be saved. And our sins uh, have been washed away as far as the east is from the west from Psalm 103. I hope you have uh, gotten something out of the lesson. I apologize for my uh, technical difficulties here, but we will get better as the uh, as the weeks uh, uh, as the weeks go go come on go ahead uh, as the weeks go forward, I should say. Uh, but God bless you and God keep you is our prayer and we uh, please attend your Sunday school lessons and be faithful in your worship and in your giving uh, every Sunday. God bless. Amen.